Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org. All right, so how many of you were here a couple weeks ago um, for the first part of the excellence message? Awesome. So we got a lot of people here who were here a couple weeks ago. I'm just going to go through real quickly. I'm going to summarize what we talked about a couple weeks ago. The message a couple weeks ago on excellence called Living Excellently, it was like extremely practical. It was very practical. It was, uh, it was more about our relationships with each other, our relationships with people, how we work at our jobs, how we are at school, how we are um, in, even in here, our, the way that we treat the atmosphere in here. We, we even talked down to like nitty gritty stuff. We talked about um, keep, keeping our phones off. We talked about, you know, during the message or during worship, not doing anything to steal from the atmosphere. Because excellence, what we defined excellence as a couple weeks ago, it means to, to go beyond. And the word excellence in the dictionary actually means to achieve outstanding quality. You guys remember that? Achieving outstanding quality. So if we're, if we're taking quality away from the atmosphere, then we're not being excellent. Okay. If we're taking quality out of the atmosphere or we're taking quality from something, we're not being excellent. But whenever we, at our jobs, the way that we work because of who is inside of us, if we're going to be excellent people, the way that we work is if we see something that needs to be done, then we do it. And we do even more than what our job description asks of us. We don't just do what our boss asks us. We do more because that's the kind of people we are because that's who lives inside of us. We talked about how God is willing to, the, the scripture that says that he will do abundantly more than we can ask, think, or imagine, right? And if that's who God is, if he will do more than we can ask, and he, he lives inside of us, we're supposed to be a reflection of him. So I would say that we're supposed to be doing more than somebody might ask of us. You hear me? Because we're a reflection of God. I talked, I talked about how wherever you go, you're not just representing yourself. You're representing who is inside of you. And so that's why we need to make sure where we go, we're on time or we're early. We need to make sure that uh, if, if something needs to be done, like I talked about school a little bit. I talked about this, this Christian guy that I looked up to in school whenever I was in high school and how I looked up to him because not only was he a year older than me, he not only was he older, me, older than me, so I looked up, up to him because of that, but also because he wasn't afraid to share his faith. He wasn't afraid to say, yeah, I'm a Christian. So I looked up to him, but then I had this class with him, and I started noticing that every time we'd come to class, if, if our teacher started calling up for some assignment that we were supposed to get done, it was like he either didn't have it or like he forgot about it or, or something, or he didn't do it correctly, or it was something like that. And I started noticing it being like, I don't feel like that's how a Christian is supposed to be. I feel like a Christian is supposed to be excellent. You're supposed to be excellent in whatever you, in everything that you do. You're supposed to practice it to the point where you feel like you've mastered it, but even the, even the best, the masters of everything in the world still say, I need to practice. You know, so it's, it's somebody like that. But I started looking at that going, you know, I don't feel like that's how, how we're supposed to be as believers. And <clears throat> in school, anytime, I talked about this, anytime my professor would ask me, ask, say, say uh, do like two to four pages of the, on a paper of whatever we're talking about. Sorry, I'm trying to rush through this part, so I'm, my tongue's twisting a little bit. But our professor would say, like, uh, do two to four pages on this paper. Or most people would say, well, two to four pages, then I'm just going to do two pages and get it done and get it out of the way because two pages is easy. Well, I would go ahead and do four. Because to me, I'm like, the professor's saying two to four for a reason. He probably wants four, but he's okay with two, right? <laughs> so I would always shoot for the four because to me, that's excellence. I'm not just going to do what is required. I want to do more than what is required. I want to do more than what's requested of me because that's who lives inside of me. Amen? So that's what excellence is. It's going beyond. It's going above because that word excellence comes from the word excel, 
which means to go beyond. So that's really the, the foundation for everything I talked about last week. Um, and when it came to what we talked about in here with during the message or, or during the worship, now we're not just trying to be nitpicky or anything. We're just trying to, to, to train you guys. We're trying to call you higher into, into a greater realm of excellence, into a greater, greater realm of responsibility that you've ever been in. So when I mention something like the cell phones, it's not just us getting onto anybody. It's me saying, hey, this is just one thing of a thousand things you can do to be an excellent person. Right? Because when your cell phone goes off in like, even if you're in, in a conference or something, like a business conference, your cell phone, cell phone goes off, like everybody looks at you, you're taken away from the atmosphere because for one, it distracts everybody else, but two, it distracts the speaker. And so you're taken away from the atmosphere. And so that to me is, is it's not excellent. Does that make sense? So that's why I brought those things up. It wasn't just to get on to anybody. So I wanted to make sure you knew that. But today is going to be very spiritual, as, as whereas, whereas a couple of weeks ago was very practical. Today's going to be very spiritual. Um, I'm going to be talking more about our relationship with God rather than our relationships with people. Um, I felt like this was this probably more important than what I talked about a couple of weeks ago, but I don't want a couple of weeks ago to seem less important at all. But uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about worship today because that's what I do. <laughs> that's what I do. Um, it's in my heart. I love worship. I, I feel like I have a heart of worship, and so I'm going to be talking a lot about worship. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the Word. I'm going to talk a little bit about prayer, but a lot of what we're talking about today is worship because I believe worship is how we communicate intimacy to God, and that's, our, that's like the basis of our relationship with Him. Okay? This is the, those are intimate moments that we have with God. Now, I'm not saying you can't have intimacy with God in the Word or in prayer, but worship is that intimacy. It's that intimate time with him. So I'm going to be talking a lot about that. But I already kind of said this. The reason I believe that we're called to live excellently is because the God inside of us is excellent. Amen? He's excellent because, what, like I said, he always goes beyond and above what we expect. The word says that. And I believe that this is, this is how... This is how we find out who we're supposed to be as Christians. I mean, Paul even said, hey, reflect me as I reflect Christ, right? So he's doing the same thing. Who is inside of me, that's who I want to be. That's who I want to be like. The God inside of me, that is who I want to reflect. That is who I want to be like. And the God inside of me goes above and beyond what I could ask, think, or imagine. So if someone asked me to vacuum the floors, I'm going to probably wipe down the counters too. Does that make sense? not just going to vacuum the floors. And, and I talked about last, a couple weeks ago, about how that can earn us promotions. When I worked at McAllister's, I was a regular employee for three months, but because I went above and beyond what I was asked to do, and I just did whatever I saw that needed to be done, I would do it. I got a promotion within three months to the number two position in the store. And, and it can earn you promotion in life. And I believe, and I, I brought this point up. Can you imagine if the body of Christ was all being excellent, living in excellence, we would be in charge of everything. Believers, the body of Christ would be in charge of everything because we would be willing to go above and beyond and we would get those promotions. We would be the CEOs of companies and we would be the presidents of this and that and we would be able to, to actually have some influence as far as, as what we can implement into different rules and regulations and things, you know, according to what the kingdom of God wants. Amen? So that's why it's so important that we do this. And, and that's why I feel like a lot of times you don't see a Christian at the top. Because what we've learned to do is we've learned to come in on Sunday morning and sit down. <laughs> That's like the basis of our relationship with God, is coming in on Sunday morning and sitting down. But there's so much more to it than that because we're called to live as his kingdom. And so when we come in here and we sit down, it's, just to, it's only to get prepared to get up and do something. <laughs> okay? You hear me? All right. So one thing I mentioned a couple weeks ago that's going to be the foundation for today's message is that God will never ask us to give anything less than everything. Anytime God asks you to give something, he's asking you to give everything. All right, and I'm going to tell you why. Now you might, you might think, but God's okay if I only give him a dollar, you know, if you're talking about money. God's okay if I only give him a dollar if I have $10 in my pocket. Well, is he? I don't know, because I think he's always wanting us to give everything. Well, God, if, you know, if God tells you to go pray for that person, well, God's okay if I only go say hi to them. 
That's not how it works. God is always wanting everything from us. And I'm going to tell you why I believe that. Because God is always giving us everything. And remember, we're to be a reflection of that, who is in, of that which is inside of us, of who is inside of us. And God always gives everything. He never only gives a little bit. You hear me? Whenever God pours himself out in, in like a worship service or something, you, you feel God in here. When God pours himself out, he's giving you the fullness of his presence. Now, I believe that if you don't experience the fullness of God whenever he pours himself out, that's not on God. You hear me? It's not God's fault if you don't experience the fullness of his presence. There could be something else that's getting in the way. But God always pours all of himself out. He's always giving all of himself. There's nothing in God that, that makes him want to only give, him, give a little bit. It's just not in his character. So he's always giving us everything. Now, how many marriages do you think work out where one spouse is always giving everything and the other spouse is only giving a little bit sometimes? <laughs> it doesn't work out. It doesn't. Something, 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 something's going to happen. Yeah, something not right is going to happen very soon. There's going to be a lot of fights. There's going to be a lot of conflict. And, and they're going to begin to drift apart. If one spouse is constantly giving everything and the other spouse is only giving a little bit sometimes, something's not going to work out. In the same way with our relationship with God, God is always giving us everything. And if we decide to only give him a little bit sometimes, our relationship with him is not going to work out. You hear me? Do you? <laughs> now, I know you, you can be like, well, what does that look like, giving God everything? Well, we're going to talk about that because that's, that's what I mean by excellence is going beyond, going beyond what, what you feel like is enough. Like, do you ever think that God thinks about it? He's like, now, what would be enough? What, if I were to give to them, what would be enough? And then he'd be like, now, let me do more than that. Like, I feel like that's how God is. Let me find where they would be satisfied and go ahead and give them a lot more than that. All right? Exceedingly and abundantly blessed. Right, Randy? <laughs> there he is. So he's always willing to give more. All right. So I want to talk about worship a lot here. Um, like I said, it's in, it's in my heart. It's, it's what I do. It's who I am. And there's, there's one man in the Bible, other than Jesus, that I always think about when it comes to worship, and it's David. He was a worshiper. I mean, I think that it was his worship that earned him the title, the man after God's own heart. All right? It was his heart for worship. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, when we come in here for worship, and I'm going to give you a little bit of instruction today. I don't want it to make you feel like you're not doing enough, but at the, same t at the same time, I want it to because I want to call you higher than where you are in worship. So it's not, I, want to, I don't want to condemn your worship and make it seem like it's not enough, but at the same time, I want to call you higher and be like, maybe it isn't enough. Maybe there is more that we can give in worship. Um, and you can apply everything we talk about concerning worship you can apply it to a number of things but when we come in here to worship if you noticed last Sunday when we had these two speakers that were probably invented 60 years ago uh, probably created maybe even more than that okay cavemen probably used them or something if we believed in cavemen or you know but we had these two speakers up here and if you didn't notice they were really terrible they were crackly they were buzzy they were fuzzy it just wasn't the best sound. It was really bassy like this. So you couldn't really understand anything that was being said probably. And I'm up there shouting and it's probably like. And you're like, yeah, you know, <laughs> but we had these speakers up here. And if you notice what happened is even though the sound quality was bad, even though the sound system wasn't working and what we're used to, it wasn't working. It's like there was a heart in, in the people in this house to really just push into worship no matter what. Okay, and if you didn't notice, it's like, I think, I think Joe mentioned it this morning. He said he was back there during worship. Um, he said he looked, he said, I don't think there's one person in here that didn't have their hands raised. And, and you might be in here going, well, I was here that week and I didn't have my hands raised, so he just didn't see me, I guess. But it's, uh, what I'm trying to say is there, there was something, no matter what the circumstances told us, there was something inside of everybody in this room that was like, I'm just here for God and I'm going to give it all to him right now. And if you notice, that was a really powerful worship set, wasn't it? Who was up here? I'm up here, I think, with my guitar, right? 
Bailey's on the piano. Jeremy's on the bass. No drums. I don't, I th he was on Wednesday. On Sunday, I don't think he was. It was like, it was kind of different, you know? It was a little bit different. So what I'm saying is, this all up here, it really doesn't matter. What I give on my guitar and what I give in the songs that I write or what Bailey gives on the piano or what Jeremy gives on the bass when he's just rocking that thing, it doesn't matter. Because what really matters is a heart that's in the room that just desires to see God glorified. Amen? I mean, think about what's the most powerful move that we've ever known in history. It was the day of Pentecost. And on the day of Pentecost, it wasn't musicians in a room. It wasn't the perfect sound system. It was a bunch of people who all came together and every single one of them was like, we just want God. And God made the most powerful move in history happened on that day when just a bunch of people came together and just decided we want God. And not one of them was out of place. And I'll talk more about this later, but not one of them stood out of place and decided, I'm not really here for God today because it says they were in one accord. So they all were there for the same reason and they were all moving together and they were all there for the same purpose. And God showed up in a greater way than you and I will probably ever witness until we get to heaven. Amen? So this up here doesn't matter. I don't even know what I'm, what I'm talking about here. I'm kind of getting off a little bit, but not really. But I want to call you higher in your worship because if you didn't notice this, I'm going to go ahead and say this. It wasn't until like the third song, I think, that we really, that stuff started really breaking out in here today. And I'm just going to talk really practically for a second. I don't want to beat you down or anything, but as a, a worship, I hate saying this, but as a worship pastor, I feel like I need to pastor the worship a little bit. Okay? So... We come in here for this first song, and, and, and Pastor Cliff has mentioned this before, too. It's like, you know, we understand sometimes people, you know, you may have maybe just had a fight with your kids this morning, and you come to church, and it's really hard to enter into worship, or maybe you've just been really sidetracked with a lot of other things that happened this morning right before you came to church, and so when you come in here, it's really hard to just be ready to give everything to God, and so, you know, we want to be patient with that and everything, but at the same time, one thing I feel like a place that we need to get to is a point where as soon as we step in that door, we're here for one reason and one reason only. As soon as we step in that door, our focus immediately shifts. Wherever our focus was, our focus is going to shift now because where we're coming into right now is a place where we're going to begin to glorify God no matter what has happened or what we think might happen. Amen? And that's where I want to get us to the point where it's like, and I've said this before, sometimes we're, we're up here and we'll start playing the music and it's like, I feel like people are still waiting on us to say something to them. Like, okay, let's all stand now because that's what we've always done. You know, it's kind of a tradition. It's kind of a ritual. Let's all stand and prepare for worship. But in all reality, what I would love to see is if you guys beat us to the point. Where it's like before we even got on stage, everybody's already ready to worship. Everybody's already entering in because that is why we're here. We're not here to hear Josh's new song. We're not here to see, that, you know, if we have a guest speaker, if we have a guest come in and lead worship. We're not here for them. We're here for God no matter what is happening up here. Right? And so I would love to see that. A heart of people so hungry for God that as soon as we walk in here, it's like everybody's just ready. We're just ready. Okay, where are we going to go today, God? Take us there. We're ready. And we want you to be glorified today above everything else. We want you to be glorified. I would love to see that. And I want to tell you right now, there have been a lot of worship sets I've been a part of where I'm not really feeling it, but I'm trying and, and I'm, I'm, I'm grinding on the axe. My, John Hudson, he used to call my guitar my battle axe. And he'd say, just up there grinding on that battle axe, you know. And so I'm up here grinding on the battle axe, trying to get things to, to happen or trying to stir something up and trying to exhort everybody into worship. And I would just love, or I'm, I was saying, sometimes I'll be up, be up there doing that and I'm not feeling much. And then all of a sudden I look back and like Josh Carr is like, yeah, whoa. And he's going crazy. Nobody else is in here. And I look back at Josh and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. And it pumps me up, you know, it gets me going, it stirs me up. And sometimes it's like, I would just love it, man. Can you imagine the power, the magnitude of the power that would be in the room if every single person was in that mode as soon as they walked in the door? 
just ready to give it all to God? So when it comes to worship, what I want us to do, what I want us to practice is instead of coming in here going, well, we're going to do the same thing that we did last Sunday. I'm going to dance the same way. I'm going to sing the same songs. I'm going to sing the same melodies. I'm going to pray the same prayers. You know, I'm going to do all of that. Instead of being in here, coming in here going, well, I've given something to God this morning. I feel good. Let's say, what haven't I given to God? What have I not given to God? When, when, a, when a singer or a songwriter writes a new song, they want it to be a song that's never been written before. And in the same way, whenever I give worship to God, I want it to be worship that I've never given to God before. What part of my body have I not used to glorify God yet? Let me go ahead and use that. I'm just going to go ahead and move my finger this morning. Because I don't really use this finger much to glorify God, you know? Or something like that. Or, I mean, and, and I know that I'm not asking everybody to just dance all the time. I feel like maybe, maybe I make the wrong impression sometimes. Like I want you to just dance like crazy. Because I know that not everybody can. I know that if he, I'm, there's just, you know, I'm not going to get into that, but I, know, I just know that he's, not everybody can dance like crazy, but I mean, like you could like tap your foot or, or maybe like, like sway a little bit or something like that's okay. Just like some movement. And sometimes we look out and it's just like, like, oh, thank you. What's this for? Oh, my nose is itching. That's what it was. <laughs> Thank you. So, <laughs> it's still itching. <laughs> I've always noticed, though, that the, ser the sermons that I do where my nose is itching, those are the best ones. So, <laughs> so that's why I keep doing that, because it, it itches right here. Um, <laughs> so get ready, okay? My nose is itching. <laughs> get, we'll get used to that as soon as I get up here next time. Oh, my nose is itching. You guys know what that means. But, but sometimes we'll come in here and it's like, it's, it's just kind of dead. And I don't mean to condemn you. I don't want to do that this morning, okay? I want you to hear my heart for, for what it really is. I want to call you into something greater. I want to call you into a greater realm of worship, a greater realm of worship than you've never been in before. Because if excellence means to go beyond, then what you have to think about is where have I been because I'm going to go even further today. Where have I been with God in worship? Because I'm going to go further than that today. Why? Not because Josh is asking me, because God deserves it. That's why. That's really why, because God deserves more. He deserves more. And I, I've seen a lot of pastors, they'll, they'll get up and they'll preach, they'll say, we need to give God more. And everybody might get fired up and they'll be like, yeah, but then nobody really does it. It's like we know we need to give God more, but then when the moment comes, we just don't. And, and like I said, I'm not asking you for more because I need more. I'm asking you for more because I know that God wants more. Amen? So when it comes to worship, I always think about David, and I think about 2 Samuel chapter 6. And I'm going to read out of the NIV. But in 2 Samuel chapter 6, and I mentioned this in worship, in worship last Sunday. Chapter 6, verse 14. What was happening in this chapter is the Ark of the Covenant was being brought back to David's city, into Jerusalem. It was being brought to Jerusalem, okay? It had been in Obed-Edom's house for a long time, and at this point it was being brought back to Jerusalem. And it was just a celebration. All right, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Have you ever heard that psalm or read that psalm before? Okay, that, that psalm is, is supposed to be the song that they sang whenever they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. That's what a lot of uh, scholars say. But they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant, which is basically the representation of the presence and the glory of God because it, it actually was said to contain the glory of God because of the artifacts that were put in it. I know it's itching even more. So they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. And it says in verse 14 of chapter 6, it says, David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might. While he and the entire house of Israel brought up the Ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. It says that he danced before the Lord with all his might. 
I've talked to this about the I've, I've talked about this to the kids before, but I'm like, do you feel like you've ever given God all your might? Like, think about it. Is there a moment you can remember where you gave God all of your might? So you're thinking, well, I don't need to give God my might because he just wants my spirit. So it's okay if, you know, it really, and I'm not saying it's not okay, so don't hear me like that. But, you, but we think sometimes it's okay if I sit here because I can worship like this too. But God wants your might too. He wants your body. He does. He didn't give us a body just to contain what he wanted. Everything right here is everything that he wants. He wants all of this. And so I'm thinking during worship, like, let me give not only my spirit and not only my mind, but let me give him my body a little bit. But have you ever given God all of your might? And can you even imagine what that looks like? I can imagine after David danced before the Lord with all his might, he probably hurt for a few days. <laughs> He was probably pretty sore. Have you ever had worship sets like that where it's like you're sore for like a week? Oh, yeah. We, we, at camp last year, I danced like this so much in the first night that my calves were sore for three weeks. I'm serious. And, I, and, and if, if you've ever seen me dance before, I love to give God everything whenever I dance in my body. And I, I, I just kind of flail everywhere and my body goes everywhere and I try to keep my eyes shut, which is kind of dangerous sometimes. But yeah, but I love to give God everything. And it's like, when I do that, sometimes I feel like I'm gonna have a heart attack. That's how, I'm not even joking. That's how much I'm trying to give to God or how much I just, I really want God to have everything in this moment. I can't contain it anymore. Something's bubbling in here. Something's trying to come out. So I'm just gonna go ahead and let it come out in my body. Whatever I can do, God, in this moment to bring you glory, I'm gonna do it right now. And I would dance before the Lord with as much strength and as much power as I can, not just be, not to fulfill anything in me or not to fulfill anything in anybody else, but because I know that, that God deserves it and that he wants it. And I'd give it to him in those moments and I would give so much of myself that I'd start to feel like I was gonna have a heart attack. There are moments I felt like I was gonna pass out. There are moments I felt like my heart was gonna beat out of my chest. That's how much I'm giving to God in that moment. And I'm not saying that I always get it right. I'm just trying to, set it to, to say that that is an example of what I feel like, what David was doing in those moments, in that moment when he began to dance before the Lord with all of his might. He was probably sore for a few weeks because of it. He probably felt like he was gonna have a heart attack because of it. He probably was out of breath completely because that is what he felt like he needed to give to God in that moment. And he couldn't contain it. He was so excited too, because why? Because the presence of God was coming into his city. God was coming into his city. God was coming into Jerusalem. And I think about it every Sunday when we gather in here, God is walking into the room. And I'm like, can you imagine if we had the heart of David and that kind of a heart of worship as God walked into the room, the heart of David then would then explode the worship that would come out? because of that realization that God is here. And I guarantee you that is what David was thinking. He was thinking, God is here. He's here. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yes. And so I wanna call you higher into that. Now, now, like I said, I'm not saying everybody needs to dance like crazy, but do something. Give a part of your body or a part of yourself that you have yet to give to God because he deserves all of it. You hear me? And that to me is excellence when you're always thinking, what have I not given to you, God? What have I not done yet? What song have I not sang yet or sung? <laughs> right? That's what, I, that's what I think it is to be excellent in worship. And then later on, Michal, Michal's looking up. That's how you pronounce it. Everybody say me. me. <laughs> All. Now say Michal. <laughs> Michal was, was up looking down on David as, as he danced. And, and then she said, she began to mock him. She was like, oh, look at David. <laughs> Dancing, making himself look like a fool. Okay, she began to mock him. And this is what David said. In verse 22. Well, let's, let's start with verse 21. David said to Michal, it was before the Lord... It was before the Lord. 
who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, over the Lord's people, Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. He said it was before the Lord. She's mocking him. You're doing this before the people. You're making yourself look like, look like a fool before the people. And he said, no, it was before the Lord. So that's the number one thing we have to realize. Listen, whenever you're giving something to God in here or wherever it's at, it's not before anybody else. It's before God. Now, now believe me, we talked about it. I mentioned it last week. You can do it before people, and that's called performance. But true worship isn't going to come out in performance. It's impossible. I said this. It's impossible to give God glory in an atmosphere of performance. And it's impossible for his throne room to be in a place of performance because in his throne room, all eyes are on him. And in an atmosphere of performance, all eyes are on you. So he's saying it wasn't before the people, it was before God. What are you talking about? And then in verse 22, he said, I will become even more. Everybody say more. More. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. What he's saying there is, hey, If it's going to bring glory to God, bring it on. But the point I want to bring up here is that he said, I will become even more. And in her eyes, there was nothing more undignified than what she had just seen. (laughs) Him making himself look like a fool in front of the people. And he's like, I don't care. (laughs) I don't care. He said, I will become even more. You see, David had a, a spirit of excellence in worship in his heart because he was willing to do even more than what he had just done. He was willing to go beyond what he had just given to God. You hear me? That is excellence in worship, and that's what we are to give to God, because that's who he is to us. That's what he gives to us. Are you hearing me? So I want us to think about that next time. When we walk in here, let's think about, first of all, I want us to think, what does it mean to give God all my might? Don't hurt yourself, please. (laughs) But think, what does it mean to give God everything? And then go ahead and give him, even next week when we come in here for worship, go ahead and give him everything. And then as you walk out, go, I'm going to give him more next week. (laughs) And you think, it's impossible to give him more than what I just gave him. But it's not. I don't think you can plateau in that area at all. I don't think you can plateau in it. I think there's always something more we can give to God. Now, this thing I want to bring up here, we're almost done. I have no idea what we're going to do after that. But something I want to bring up here is is what I feel like is the greatest enemy of excellence. And I want you to hear me. What I feel like is the greatest enemy of excellence is familiarity. It's familiarity. I'll tell you why. Because, and I've seen people do this, people will leave church because of this. People come to church on a Sunday morning and they're like, well, I'm going to come to church. It's the same church. I'm going to sit down in the same seat. I'm going to listen to the same person lead worship. You know, Josh or Bailey's going to sing. Then, you know, Pastor Cliff or somebody's going to get up and speak. Somebody I've heard before a lot of times. And then I'm going to get up and then I'm going to leave. And people will leave unchanged in circumstances like that because they become too familiar with the circumstances. They become too familiar with their surroundings. And what I mean by that is that you get to a point where you're so familiar with something or someone that you can no longer receive anything new from them. Hear me? Hear me? We become so familiar with something or someone that we can no longer receive anything new from them. And I feel like this is a part of the reason that the body of Christ at large has become pretty stagnant. Because we're so familiar with our routines and we're so familiar with our agendas that it's just to go in here, get that, leave, we're done. And that's it. I checked it off the list. I went to church this week. I'm good to go. But it can't be like that. Because, and let me bring up this point, you know that if we brought a guest in here to lead worship who was really anointed, say we brought in Matt Redman to lead worship, you'd be like, oh, Matt Redman's coming today. We're going to get something today because you're not familiar with it. But then somebody else that you've seen every Sunday, 
gets up to lead worship and you're like, mm, okay. And you can't get anything out of it because you're so familiar with it. So if we're going to achieve excellence even in our worship, we have to be willing to overlook familiarity. <clears throat> you hear me? If somebody that you know very well you know their background, you know their story, you know everything about them. If somebody that you know very well came up to you and began to give you a word from God, would you be able to receive it as a word from God? Or would, you, or would it be hard to receive it because you know all about him? You know all about that person that's given you that word. You'd be like, well, I know where that's coming from because they did this 10 years ago. That's really from a heart of hurt. I don't think I can receive that. Or something like that. Bill Johnson brought, up, brought it up one time. He said... He recognized it. The moment he recognized it was when somebody came forward to him. He knew everything about them. He had seen them all the time. He knew all of their junk. He knew all of their good stuff. He knew everything it was to know about them. He saw them every, every Sunday or every week or something like that. And they began giving him a word that they felt like was from God. And he didn't hear it because he knew them too well. And he wasn't willing to overlook the familiarity. And it was weeks later that God revealed himself to, 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 to Bill through that word and Bill missed it because he was unwilling to look, overlook the familiarity of that person and actually hear it as a word from God. You hear me? So there's sometimes you come in here and you're like, well, I wonder who's preaching today. So-and-so is getting up there to preach them today. I've heard them so many times before. I'm just going to kind of sit here and maybe try to listen, but I don't know if it's actually going to happen. I'm going to walk out and I'm going to forget everything that was said. And you leave unchanged because you're too familiar with the voice that's speaking. But when we do that, we don't allow God to reveal more of himself to us. Because God may be wanting to speak something to us, and because of our unwillingness, our inability to overlook familiarity, we can't hear God through that person. You hear me? Do you hear me? Yeah. And in the same thing with praying. How many of you like have a prayer that you pray every day? I'm not, I'm not condemning this. It, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty traditional, okay? It's pretty natural to have a prayer that you pray every day. Whenever I was a kid, I had this prayer that I memorized. I wrote it down and I memorized it. And every night I, I would pray it to God. And every night it got faster. <laughs> every night it got faster. Where, where before it took me three minutes, it started taking me two minutes, and then it would take me one minute, and then 30 seconds, and then 15 seconds. And I'm like, man, I'm getting that prayer done right? And while that's good, I think when you're praying the same prayer and you're singing the same song, when you become too familiar with it to the point where it just becomes something you're reciting, then the heart in it goes away. And we can, and, and I've had a lot of people, a lot of people come up, can you play my favorite song today? And I'm going, I don't really want to. <laughs> And, and it's not anything against them. It's like, I don't want to because I, I don't want to play your favorite song because it's your favorite song. I want to play your favorite song if there's going to be something there that God wants to do in that favorite song. Or if you're going to really touch God in that favorite song. And I don't want to play a favorite song if it just gives you goosebumps. I want to play a favorite song if there's actually going to be a brand new revelational encounter that you're going to have with him whenever that song is played. And in the same way, I don't want to pray the same prayer just because it's a good prayer and it's got really nice words if there's not going to be any heart in it. I want to pray, and, and, and this brings me to the, to the Lord's Prayer. Remember, the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This is not what to pray, this is how to pray. Remember, Jesus didn't teach them what to pray. He taught them how to pray. Now, does that mean that you shouldn't pray that prayer? No, not at all. Because if you pray that prayer and your heart is in it, you hear me? If you pray that prayer and your heart is in it, go ahead and pray it word for word. But don't recite something. Amen? Go beyond. Go above that a little bit. Let's do a little bit more. Yeah, we know this song really well, but let's go a little bit further this time. You hear me? And even with the word, everybody and their dog knows John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him shall not per perish but have everlasting life. Everybody knows that scripture. But how many times have you recited it and not 
taken a second to realize the power that's in it. There are all kinds of scriptures, all kinds of verses that we know in the word of God that because we know them so well, God cannot reveal himself to us further through them. You hear me? In John 3, 16, you know why it's known so well, why everybody knows it? Because it's probably the most powerful verse in the Bible. Yet we recite it as though it has no power at all. And I believe that whenever you're reading the word, any verses that come up when you're reading the word, even if you already know them, you may be tempted to, to, you're reading John chapter 3 and you come across verse 16 and you're tempted to pass over it because you already know it. But God may want to show you something in it. Even if you're familiar with that verse already, God may want to show you something in it you've never seen before or you've never heard before. And you may be like, well, so-and-so is going to preach on the, on the armor of God today. Well, I know all about the armor of God. And the whole time the person's preaching on the armor of God, you're thinking about everything you already know about the armor of God instead of allowing God to show you something new that you might not know about the armor of God. You hear me? And so God works in that way. And this is where I believe we can attribute excellence to that because we're always willing to go beyond what we already know, what we're already familiar with, or where we've already been. That is what excellence is. I'm going to go even further today, God. God, I know I've heard this scripture 20,000 times, but today for the 20,000 and one time, first, that's not even a thing, the 20,000 and first time today, God, I want you to show me something that you've never shown me before. Light up something in this scripture I've never seen before. You hear me? There are songs that I'll sing that that I I have been doing for 20 years now. There are songs that I will sing. We sang one today that is literally 20 years old. There is none like you. That was a song written by my mentor. I've sang that song so many times. And today, today God showed me a different part in that song, a different piece of himself in that song. Whenever I'm singing, there is none like you, I've never thought about this way, it this way, but I'm singing, there is none like you, and God is singing, but do you really know that? Have you seen that side of me? to where you really know that there is none like me. And that's what I'm hearing from God and I've never heard that before. And the song I've been singing for 20 years. And so that to me is excellence. It's our willingness to go beyond what we already know or what you think you know, or what you think you understand, or what you think you realize about God. That's the moment we get stuck when we think that we know God because we should be spending this our entire life getting to know him. Amen? And I believe the best marriages, the most successful marriages, they're still finding new things out about each other after being married for 50 years. Is that happening with you guys? You've been married a while? Anybody else that happening with? I hope so, nobody's raising their hands. But I hope. But I believe, the mo- there you go, the most successful marriages, most successful re- relationships, you're still finding more out about each other. Why? Because you're willing to go beyond what you already know. You hear me? It's like maybe I've asked her 10,000 questions, but what's the next question I can ask her that maybe I haven't ever asked her before? You know, or something like that. And in the same way with God, we can't ever get to that place with God where we're just not ready to move forward with him. And we're not ready to to see more of him. I have this theory, and I don't know if it's true. I'm going to find out when I get to heaven. I'm closing right now. I'm going to find out when I get to heaven. I have this theory, you know, that the angels supposedly circle. It says they circle around the throne. And I have this theory that not not one angel in the history of God, wherever it started... Not one angel has made it full circle around God. I have this theory because I believe that this is what they do. I believe they get stuck on one side of God. They can get stuck on one side of God for decades, for centuries. They get stuck on one side of God, and they're not singing the same thing every time they sing. Yeah, they're singing holy, 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 but they're not singing the same thing because this one side of God is actually showing them a million other sides of God just in this one viewpoint of him. Maybe they're looking at the back of of the head of Jesus 
or something. And that's all that they can see. And they see it for centuries. And I don't know what time is like up there, but they see it for centuries. And they're just looking at the back of his head. But just looking at the back of his head, they're looking at all the little details. And in each little tiny detail, it's showing them a different part of God that they've never seen before. You hear me? And so I have this theory that not one of them has been able, not just that they haven't been willing, but not one of them has been able to make it full circle around God because they don't want to. Because they're so stuck on this one side. Because it keeps showing them all kinds of different things about God. You see, they've opened themselves to revelation in his very presence. And the same way, when we come in here to worship God, I want us to be ready for that. That is God, we feel him walk into the room. And I, honestly, I've talked about this before, but I think he's, he shows up before we do. But as we feel God, we know he's in the room. Let's just allow ourselves to, to allow him to reveal himself to us in a way we've never seen before. That to me is excellence because it speaks of going beyond. Amen? Let's stand. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org.